Hi everyone, uh, my name is Andrew Evans. You might notice I am not Suzanne Gibbs Howard, at least not yet. Um, we have a special broadcast today coming in live from the Magic Patio, which is actually a magic venue that I built here in San Francisco with a bunch of friends. Uh, it's a rather bizarre experience, frankly, to be staring at a camera at about 50 empty seats as well. Um, but it is such a treat to get to perform and speak with you here. Also, we're getting people from all over. I see Stuttgart and uh, Iran, Seattle, hometown, lovely. So exciting to have you all here, in a sense, with me. Uh, so with that, it is my great pleasure to say to all of you, welcome to the Magic Patio. I am Suzanne Gibbs Howard, and I want to welcome you to a special episode of the Creative Confidence live broadcast. We are here at the Magic Patio, and today we will also have another conversation about creativity, leadership, innovation, and growth with my special guest, who you already met, Andrew Evans. Uh, we always open up the end of that conversation to all of you, so please keep introducing yourself in the chat. Let us know where you are today and go ahead and ask us questions and we will try to get you answers to the things you're wondering about. Um, we will introduce our special guest. So Andrew is somebody who we wanted to bring on. We wanted to do something a little bit different at the end of the year, bring a little more joy, bring a little more wonder and also a little extra magic. And so Andrew is a dear friend of mine. He and I have known each other for a good few years. He started off, or he's always been somebody who's obsessed with the intersection of engineering and art. And so he started off his career working in very high-end treehouse design up in Seattle, where he's from. And you may have seen him on the um, TV show Treehouse Masters. After that, he wanted to push it further. He did a master's degree in product design at Stanford. After that, he ended up at IDEO, and that's where I met him. I had the good fortune of getting to work with him on many projects. He also was one of the early people who helped me to think through some of the ideas for IDEO U, and I am forever thankful for him for that. While he was working at IDEO, he always had things going with magic in the back of his mind and in the back of his apartment building, frankly. He literally built 
a patio, a theater for magic in his backyard. And that very quickly became one of the most sought out destinations for live performance in San, in San Francisco. He eventually, with the help of many friends, some of whom are here with us today, took that to be his full-time gig. And so now you can find more about him at magicpatio.com. He continues to think about the flow between design and magic, and he goes back and forth between the two. You may have seen his magic at Magic Castle in Los Angeles and Hollywood on Penn and Teller's Fool Us. And also his work about design, he speaks at places like Google, Apple, Disney about creating more wonder. And so today, I'd love to bring Andrew on. Thank you so much Thank for joining you. us today. Yeah. And we're going to talk together about the intersections between magic and design and how principles from magic can inform things with product, service, and the experiences that you create for your employees. Absolutely. Yeah. Yay. So welcome, Andrew, Thank to you. the Creative Confidence yeah. Series. So I know a lot of people are curious about magic, love magic. They don't know how to get a start as a magician. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you started getting into your passion. Yes, absolutely. So uh, for me, I started when I was about six years old. I feel like everyone gets a magic kit at some point when they're a kid. Um, and I really just never put mine down. But I actually did a talent show when I was in when I was six years old, like first grade talent show at my elementary school, which was one of a very large show, actually. But anyways, um, from there, I always stuck with magic. I was performing throughout high school and performing at birthday parties. When I got to college, I was studying engineering in particular and theater and then really finding ways to design and build my own magic tricks is when I would say I figured out my own voice in all of this. So I almost approach magic. Uh, as much as a designer, uh, as a performer, and kind of that intersection there is what brought me to it. So cool. And then tree houses, little side project, oh, also yeah. magic, also engineering, yes. right? For yes, those of us who love tree houses and the best of the tree houses. But then um, when you were at Stanford, I know you started to crystallize that there were really true overlaps that could make both magic and design better. And tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I would say kind of in grad school when I was studying human-centered design for the first time really formally, and then also at IDEO where that's the work that we were doing every single day, it started to dawn on me that um, designing products, experiences, services through the lens of the people you're designing for is sort of how I design magic as well. So I like to think of myself maybe as an audience-centered magician. So mm -hmm. instead of just focusing on the tricks and the sleight of hand and all that, I love really thinking about the whole experience of magic for the audience audience beyond the tricks and on the stage, but also the space, the whole experience, um, you know, the magic patio. I think half of what's really special about this is not just the shows we do, the space and the experience that we created. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. So it's kind of like magic and empathy informing each other. Absolutely, yes. So I know there's a lot of talk in the world, but we also love to do. And mm -hmm. so we'd love to have Andrew show you a little bit of his magic. Beautiful. You want to share? Yeah. Okay. Get it, we'll get it started. Good. All right. Um, well, it was actually interesting. Uh, over the past couple of years, obviously, we weren't able to have live audiences in the space in the same way. And so I started doing shows, you know, across the internet for Zoom. I think in the end, we performed for over 100,000 people worldwide, actually, which was amazing. But at the beginning of it all, it was interesting to figure out how to come up with new magic tricks and hard to get out of the apartment. So I was trying to figure out magic I could do with stuff that I just had laying around. Um, I'm here in San Francisco, close to Napa Valley. There's some nice wine here. So, you know, I had a few bottles of wine. Um, also, I was ordering everything off the internet. So we had a ton of cardboard boxes and packing tubes. And I found sort of a fun way to actually bring those things together into a little moment. Actually, you know what? Let me just show you. It goes a little something like this. All right, so here's the idea. Basically, what I wanted to do was a very simple trick using a few very simple things. Uh, easy enough to come by a wine glass. Also easy enough to come by a bottle of wine. Oh, this happens to be a French Bordeaux today. Very classy. Uh, anyways, the point of this trick, it's super, super simple. All I'm trying to do is to get the glass and the bottle to switch places. Obviously, I can't let you see how it works. That's what the cardboard tubes are for. So again, very simple. We're going to get the glass to go from this side of the table all the way over to here. And I'm going to get the bottle to go from here. Oh, come on. Hey, sorry, can we just rewind the stream like four or five seconds? Take it back. Oh, no, it's live. Uh, okay. Um, okay, sorry. You know what? That's sorry. Not a problem. Let me just. 
I'll explain. It's not, it, look, just, when you're doing magic with breakable things, you know what I mean? Like glasses and bottles, it's just, uh, it's like typically you want to have an extra one on hand just in case of accidents. It's like a theater thing, you know, you back up your props. Okay, anyways, uh, don't worry about it. Point of this trick, again, very simple. We're gonna get the glass to go from here over to here. The bottle is gonna go from here over to here. It's easy, just watch. Yep, it worked. But see, that's the easy part of this trick. Much harder part is getting them to go back. Thank you so much, everyone. Truly my privilege, pleasure, in fact, to perform for you here. This, yeah, okay, yeah. No, sorry, I know it is a little early, at least here in the US, where we're calling in from. Uh, typically when I'm performing this, people have actually consumed the contents of a few bottles, which makes it much easier to believe me when I say that getting the glass and bottle to switch places is in fact the easy part. Getting them to go back, much more difficult. <laughs> There we go. But here, let me explain. If you're trying to follow the logic with all of this, totally reasonable. You just gotta remember, tube number one always has to be the one that goes over the bottle. And then of course, that means that tube number, oh. Uh, okay, that's, that's on me. Well, that, okay. Look, it is, it is an extra bottle, but it doesn't really matter. The, the point is, j just you gotta know that tube number two has to be the one that goes over the glass. Again, that becomes a bottle, bottle becomes a glass. That's tube number one, always over the bottle. Tube number, uh, too many bottles, sorry. That's tube number two, once again, goes over the glass. Like I said, that becomes a bottle, bottle becomes a glass, and I think that's a pretty good trick. Whew. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I will say, um, this is interesting. I, I was doing this when I started doing it over Zoom in particular. Every once in a while, people seem to be into it, but I did have this one person in a show. It was interesting. He unmuted himself. He leaned into the camera and he was like, yeah, I bet you can't do it with one tube. I found that to be a pretty aggressive request. But uh, look, the truth is you could. You could actually do this trick with just a single two. Again, the glass becomes a bottle as before. The bottle does become the glass. The issue if you do it that way, you gotta have this extra bottle. People cannot be aware of this one. You know what I mean? That gives it all away. So if you do it that way, like I said, glass becomes the bottle. Once again, the bottle does become the glass. However, one tube, it only works if you have this. No one can know about this one. That's very important. But either, what? Oh no, either of the tubes. This is not a problem, team. Look, again, the glass becomes a bottle. Bottle does become the glass. But it only works if you have this extra bottle. People cannot know about it. You know what I mean? Um, and oof, honestly, this all starts to get like a little confusing. Um, so I'll tell you, if you confuse a magician, you're in trouble. Um, so I actually just like to mark one of these bottles. Uh, makes it a lot easier to follow. As you see, when that bottle goes from one side of the table all the way over to the other, just like that, see? Easier, right? But hold on, I did tell you that's the easy direction, much harder getting them to go uh, back. Well, you know what? If you start seeing double, then generally that's the moment to stop. So wherever you're calling in from, thanks for joining us here at the Magic Patio. Cheers, everyone. Mm. Mm. Little early, actually, for red wine here in San Francisco, I think, but there we go, lovely. All right, and with that, we're gonna have a nice little after party, I think, but maybe we will bring Suze back up. All right. Thank you. I mean, I've seen that shirt dozens of times and I still, I was inches from him and I can't figure it out, it was amazing. <laughs> oh, cheers, yeah. Yeah, all right, so we're gonna sit down and have a little chat. All right. Okay, how does that look? Are we in frame? Oh, there's some wine bottles there. That's fine. <laughs> all right, so what we wanna do now is take the experience that you just created yeah. for our community 
and break it into pieces and talk about what exactly went on. When you talk to other companies, what are the kinds of things that you tell them they can bring from magic into design? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, sort of one of the things I always like to think about is just what is this experience of magic? And sort of for an audience, you know, you see something like that with the wine bottles and there's some fun because you know that you shouldn't just be able to make things appear from nothing, right? So we have this general understanding of what the world is and looks like. And then a magician's job is to break that in some mm. way. And I would say companies are doing something similar often um, with different things that they're creating. So we have some sense of expectation of what exists in the world, how we, how we exist in the world, how we interact with it. And good innovation is really fundamentally changing the way that we see that. So huh. when you're applying it that way, it actually yeah. definitely feels like magic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I know you have a couple of principles that you often talk about. Yeah. Um, why don't you talk about share one of them with our community. Yeah, well, it's actually fun. So what you've seen here already from the introduction to the wine bottles, a lot of that is using these principles in action. So mm -hmm. I'm actually even just talk about some of that. Um, mm -hmm. Like one of the first principles I always think about in designing wonder, magic, or that experience is the idea of the context you're designing in and how to shift that in some way. So right off the bat, even this introduction here today, you know, we are in Zoom. That's something that, well, I guess people are watching this from different things. But if you're in Zoom, people are very familiar with that medium. They've spent hours probably unhappily in it <laughs> at times. Uh, so the goal became when we were recreating a magic patio in a virtual environment was how to break the expectations of that virtual yeah. environment. So right off the bat, you may have noticed we had red curtains closed. When I jump in front of the camera, most people think that's a virtual background, which is sort of fun. Um, and then right away, we do a sound cue. There's an animation cue that happens on screen. And that's pretty high production value in a sense that people are not used to seeing in Zoom. Right. Yeah. So um, that's a sense of how to just without even doing a magic trick, create a sense of wonder by playing with the context. So nice. Yes. nice. OK, so I can see how that works for magic. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes a lot of sense. But I think in design, we often think about designing for the context, understanding the context, staying yeah. within it. What's an example of breaking context or playing with it? Totally. Mind. Well, also worth mentioning that to break something, you kind of really have to have deep empathy for it. Yeah. You've got to understand it before you can mess with it, at least in satisfying ways. So mm -hmm. uh, one example that comes to mind is uh, a product actually that um, we helped develop even at IDEO called Willow. Um, that's the company. And this is a this is an amazing product. Um, to my knowledge, one of the first portable breast pumps. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't claim firsthand experience. Portable ones that's nice to use, we'll say. Fair, mm -hmm. fair, yes. Mm -hmm. And I uh, certainly can't claim any <laughs> experience with breast pumping, but from all the research and all the stories, it's just uh, not a great experience typically. Mm -hmm. So what you would see there was sort of this product that um, met women in their context, allowed them to sort of not have to put their entire lives on hold for the moment of pumping, um, contained device, and it was something that, from my understanding, kind of was really helpful to a lot of people and definitely kind felt of, like magic. Yeah, it's kind of magically hidden. So you yes. can get through doing some of those things and you can literally wear it yeah. as you're walking around um, for so many people who need to do it while they're commuting back in the day. Those right. Things, and a while on a Zoom. Yes. Kind of magic. Zoom. Wow, yeah, totally. <laughs> exactly. Very cool. Okay, yeah, that definitely breaks context. You used to think yeah. about something like breast pumping was like hidden behind closed doors, like yes. my mom always talked about, like in a broom closet back in the day. So to be able to do that awkward, yeah. while literally doing other things is amazing. Yeah. Okay, so context is one principle. What else yes. do you pull over from that? Uh, another one I talked about are rhythms. So designing sort of these different beats or rhythms throughout something. Um, Often in design, we actually talk about setting rhythms and then following them as a way that you know users are engaging with something and they kind of know what to expect. They have a sense of it. So they're not getting caught off guard. They're not getting frustrated. In magic, it's sort of funny. It's actually by messing with those rhythms a little bit that you can kind of heighten attention and focus and create something that feels rather fun. So even in what you saw with magic in the wine bottles, like it's, you know, the rhythm of just the glass and the bottle are going to switch places. And then every time like a new bottle starts appearing and all of that, it's sort of by playing with those rhythms that you start to, you know, create something kind of delightful or fun. Yeah. Um, but also, I think by establishing rhythms in other contexts, apart from magic, we're able to, yeah, find uh, 
opportunities uh, where maybe they don't exist otherwise. So if there's just a bunch of empty space, like how you fill that is maybe stressful and, you know, but by creating rhythms, you end up creating something that can provide new opportunities and uh, yeah. conversations, all that. Yeah, it's so I, I feel like in IDEA, we often talk about the choreography mm. of an experience and you literally almost bring like a musicality to your performance, like the beats that you are following in that wine bottle trick are yes. just amazing. Yeah. But again, you mess with them, right? And you know yeah. when to stay on beat and when to go off. And so what's an experience? Yeah, that um, that? so, and this is actually an experience where it's sort of highlighting a way to create rhythms where nothing exists before. Mm -hmm. um, and so this example is from um, two dear friends started an incredible design company out in Detroit, Michigan um, called Sevilla. And they do incredible work. But um, the, the piece here that comes to mind when it uh, relates to rhythms are how they actually start and end every single day with mm -hmm. in their studio. So um, at 10 a.m. every day, the team gathers together in what they call the dream cocoon. So we can see here on the slide, it's this fun wooden structure that they've created. Um, it sort of feels, yeah, like art and architecture in the middle of a design space. And the entire team gathers together, does a check-in, talks about what's going to be going on with their day. Um, and then off, there's also like a question that everyone checks in with. So I was just out there last week, actually, and one of the questions I asked was, what's everyone's favorite cookie? So just, you know, some moment like that. And then people go around, uh, have their day. And at the end, 5 PM, everyone checks out. And so there's that really nice sort of rhythm and drum beat um, that, again, rather than just having this people kind of streaming into work, streaming out of work, there are these moments, these designed rhythms that kind of let everyone come together, share something, and then go their separate ways. Nice. And I think what's so special about that, so many companies these days have stand-ups, mm -hmm. check-ins, those kinds of things, but to really bring, elevate it and bring some elegance to that and having it in a special place, having special rituals around it is so nice. And I feel like those, we've talked about this in other sessions, like those kinds of rhythms and that kind of yeah. structure, especially in times that are hard for people, bring uh, uh, comfort to yeah. people. And honestly, it's almost even now that I'm thinking about it, what you mentioned sort of heightening that experience, it's actually also breaking the context a little bit, right? Yeah. Of going into a design studio, um, having your workspace, it's saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. But before all of that, let's have this rhythm, this ritual, in a space designed for this. Um, so actually, I think that's even where some of the wonder comes from. So yeah. that's two for one on the yeah. designing wonder principles. Nice. All right, let's go three for three. So okay. what's the third principle that you bring in from Magic? Uh, a third thing I talk about a lot is designing for transitions. So those interstitial moments. Um, I think in design, uh, we would often explore you know, a user journey. So like A, B, C, these different points along uh, a user experience of product, service, anything really. Um, and then we design for those moments specifically. We say, how can we make those moments, those milestones, those touch points better? Um, which is good. That's a great way to go. Yeah, um, absolutely. But there's also this way to add, I think just a little bit of wonder. It's, it's almost like a hack because it's so easy. But instead of just looking at A, B, and C, it, like if you start looking at what's A.5, like that little in-between space that no mm -hmm. one is considering kind of as an opportunity for design, the second you do anything, even something small, you can just create the sense of the Yeah, wonder. yeah. And those transitions are always the places I find in doing service design experiences that the ball gets dropped. Mm. Basically, like one team's in charge of one piece of the experience. Maybe it's the front of house people and the other people are in charge of another. In a restaurant, it might be like the the people in wine or the people in, you know, serving them, yeah. making the food. And the fact that those teams can't collaborate with each other is when that 8.5 gets missed. Yes. Um, so it's such a hard thing to pull off these transitions. Yeah. But share with us an example of yeah. what good looks like. This is, uh, I would say this is what great looks like. I love this example. And this is um, in service design, actually. So mm -hmm. great, great segue. Uh, we, this was actually a story that was related to me about uh, 10 plus years ago. So just to set the context, this is before the moment of cell phones and people being able to set an alarm themselves. Um, but so work colleague was staying in New York for a trip and was in a hotel, calls down the front desk and asks for a wake up call at 7 a.m. So great. Uh, she goes to bed. 7 a.m. comes around. Her phone rings. She picks it up and then hears a click 
and a dial tone. Yeah, so you think something's off Maybe. and rude. Even. Right. And then at that very same moment, there's a knock on her front door. So kind of groggy, she gets up, goes to the front door, opens it, and instead of seeing a person, there's a steaming cup of coffee and a biscotti just waiting for her. And like, I love that. Again, I mean, never mind, like, the bellhop who's just sprinting down the hall. He's like, get out, go around the corner, get out of sight. But, but I mean, the idea that that wake up call is an opportunity for design, you know, and I just have to imagine that that person is sort of then going around the rest of their day saying like, what else is out there that I'm not yeah. picking up on? And, and yeah. So elegant, Yeah. you know, and thinking about which moments really matter. You can't do that every single step of the way, of course but not. knowing that wake up moment is going to set that person up for a beautiful day and make them so happy that they engaged and stayed at that hotel. Yeah. That is a moment that truly matters. So it's worth it to work across the people who are at the front desk with the phone calls and the people who are delivering the coffee to make that yeah. so elegant and beautiful. Definitely. Nice. Yeah. So talking about, um, I feel like one of the things you're saying with magic is that you're, you're messing with people's, you're extraordinarily empathic to you and understanding mm -hmm. people's and messing with them gently to elevate the experience, make it more wonderful make it more memorable. Yeah. Make it more I joyful. mean, definitely, uh, you know, if, if magic is an art of exposing audiences to ideas and worlds they never thought possible, I would say design is very similar, but rather than just showing people something that they think is impossible, yeah. it's asking them to participate in it yeah. and have that firsthand experience of it, which, um, yeah, being on the inside of magic is probably the only thing better than being on the outside and seeing magic. So, yeah, yeah, true, true. Well, I know we're going to get to questions from our community in just a few moments. So please, if there's something that you're working on and you're thinking, God, I wish this was a little more magical, give us some of the things that you're trying to think through yourselves. Um, I have a few more questions for you, though. Yeah. I know I watched you as COVID hit you just opened your own magic studio. Everybody was rooting for you. It was so amazing. And then COVID hit and you can't do magic right. live, which is part of the beauty. And you went into the virtual world. What are some of the things that you learned mm -hmm. through that experience? Yeah, I mean, kind of, first of all, thank you for that. <laughs> um, appreciate feeling rooted for. Uh, but yeah, I mean, again, it was very clear very early on that both what excited me about the Magic Patio and the team of friends and folks that I was working uh, to create this thing with was not just the magic. So originally it started, as you mentioned, in my backyard patio. Uh, we ran shows out there for five years or so until the city got wind of what was going on and said, no, no, no. Uh, yes, but, so we're legit now. This is true. This is true. <laughs> Coming to you from a an indoor, much more legal space. Um, but even that first transition, uh, you know, from something that felt so distinct and special in someone's home to watch magic to now what felt a little more familiar, like an indoor venue, um, figuring out the different design touch points of the space and the, the experience here. Um, to again, feel like there was magic before you even saw a trick. So we asked that same question when we went into the virtual space. And uh, we actually were very quick to do some live streams when myself and the world thought maybe this whole pandemic was gonna be a couple weeks or two months. And we were like, great, we'll just do some fun live streams to give people things to see. Not so much. So yeah. uh, once it became clear that we needed to actually create a business model around virtual shows in order to keep all of this going, uh, we shifted to Zoom, started doing a bunch of shows for corporate audiences. But even then, it was, again, asking these questions. What, what's the context of Zoom? How do we play mm -hmm. with that? What are the rhythms we can add to that? Um, and in particular, those transition moments, things like music cues, uh, some of the intro slides, outro slides. So things that I would say two plus years ago, really, I didn't see anywhere in the video yeah. conferencing space. And thankfully, I don't claim that these ideas are unique. A lot of people have found fun ways to bring all this stuff to the virtual environment. But it's so. also all the ways that you stitch everything together. Yeah, so a holistic true. view from that's an audience-centered perspective. Yeah. Very cool. Actually, just to call out right now, hopefully this looks all effortless and we look nicely lit and you can hear us. But also, there are a bunch of people behind the scenes yes. that are making this possible, from the IDO U team for the streaming. From uh, the Magic Patio team. Yes. And in fact, actually, just to call him out, Neil Boyer is someone yeah. who I hired to work with me here at the Magic Patio and he was here for two years before then going to IDEO. Yes. So, uh, yes. Fluid you, movement yeah, back and forth. That's, that's right. But <laughs> no, all of, this takes a lot of effort and a lot of, yeah. uh, a lot of stuff from a lot of people. Nice. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, let's go to some questions from our audience. Great. I think a few people are giving you some pretty challenging mm. tasks. So from Ludmila, uh, how do you bring magic to dull tasks like documentation updates? Wow, <laughs> throwing a curveball at the first question. Oh, goodness, Ooh, okay. This one together. Um, I, well, so first of all, I think, let's let's see. Um, I'll throw out one you that comes one? to mind. We're okay. gonna brainstorm with you here, but so I go to the idea of rhythms, mm -hmm. right? And drum beats, and if you can elevate the moment of updating documents, how can you have a little more ritual around it? or fabulous prizes for whoever gets it done in time, but also something that makes it a little more exciting than just going in. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes a ton of sense. And it's almost similar to that um, myself, like just doing a bunch of things like, I don't know, whatever it is, emails, invoicing. I don't know if that's quite documentation, but kind of going back to this idea of context, um, saying if that task itself isn't going to change, how can I change what's happening around it? And at this point, I just like bring my laptop and find a new cafe in the city, plop myself down for an hour and just, you know, pump out some of those emails or find a new space. So I've actually used some of that more dull, mundane work as an opportunity to explore and engage with curiosity. And yeah. kind of, it's been fun to find new places in the city that I hadn't known about even after living here for 10 years. Yeah, Ooh, I have another one. Okay. We, at my house, we do something called One Song Tidy Up because we all hate cleaning. And so we put on somebody gets to DJ, curate the song, bring it in there. And then for the space of one song, we just clean up the mess. And mm. we could do that with documentation. Different people around your organization could send out the song that you played during which I love that. you tidy and then, up your document. And then like every month, a new playlist comes out with all the document. Oh, this is fun. The tidy up document playlist. That's oh, awesome. I like it. All right, so let's go on now. Okay, good, done with that. Angela, Angela is asking us, how would you incorporate magic into a conference or event planning? Oh yeah, so, um, uh, feel free to call me and I can do that for you directly. I do do a lot of that. But I, a couple ways there. One, so I think, um, again, there's this question of actual kind of my style sleight of hand magic versus something that feels like magic in a space. Um, for, you know, the second you see in corporate, or sorry, incorporate, but also I see the word corporate. Um, so shifting the context as much as possible. Once again, I keep harping on that. But um, when you go to a uh, convention space or even if you're hosting something in an office space how do you just change that environment a little bit ask people to engage with something differently um i mean truthfully that's where often i will get hired to walk around and do magic because yeah. there's this who's this kind of intriguing person we don't know and oh wow that's just shifting yeah. your space yeah. yeah so it doesn't have to be magic specifically but um I shifting think, venues that's yes. an always easy but i think also bringing in people from the outside absolutely who have something i think a lot of times what we both have seen is that that, um, and we've designed a lot of workshops yes. together, um, is bringing in somebody who's completely from outside of your business context. And that's so easy to do. Mm -hmm. And yet people just forget it all the time. They're in retail, so they're just bringing in people in retail. They're in medicine, and so they're just bringing in people in science and medicine. What if you bring in somebody from retail to science and medicine and somebody from science into retail and they're amazing learning? So you're looking for that through line that yep. connects across like magic and design but you're, you're the curator bringing those things together to make the event more special. And I would say the other thing that asks participants to do is find those connections, connect those dots. And I think a lot of times in those events, I expect to be talked at rather than engaged with. And so yeah. even just by seeing things that are different than my everyday work experience and having to use my brain a little differently, I mean, yeah, that feels like yeah. magic for sure. Yeah, that's great, that's great. Okay, from Jasper is wondering how to make design strategy magical. So is that like the, um, the process of doing the strategy or presenting the strategy? We can kind of run with that one. Interesting. Well, yeah, actually this, this makes me think of um, something that I did once at IDEO, which was where we were presenting to clients and we had five different opportunity spaces. Um, and it was a group of clients who I think were a little hesitant to try for some of the big ideas. And so we had these five boards with our five opportunities. And then we said, look, uh, thank you for hiring us. The truth is we found these opportunities and then realized that there are actually already five startups who are really focusing mm. on each of these. And you might be too late to the game, um, but we brought the founders here to introduce to you what they're doing. And maybe there's an interesting opportunity 
to work with them. And then like I had my button up shirt on and I started unbuttoning my shirt, which first of all, I realized that now, but as I unbuttoned my shirt underneath was a t-shirt that we had printed with like a fake startup company. Uh -huh. And so then suddenly, boom, I switched into startup mode. And for this one, this was around uh, gaming and we were talking about um, participatory gaming. So I said, you know, I started doing my startup spiel about how to make gamers participate and be part of the action, not just passive viewers and all this, but I took on a different character. And nice. then we had the team members do that for each of the five opportunity areas. And at the end, we gave a stack of money, I mean, like fake money, but to the clients and told them to invest. And so yeah. they would pin their dollars up on the board. And what we did, I would say, was we took people out of the normal heads that they're engaging with strategy with and asked them to just be a little playful and engage with that design differently or the design strategy differently. And so then they're fighting with each other, being like, no, 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 we gotta invest more over here. And oh, that, you know. And so again, we had this really rich conversation um, that I would say was not a conversation they would have been able to have without pretending that they were someone else and yeah. being very playful with how we were That's presenting so that strategy. That's nice. I think you're bringing more theater to it and also setting the context, like elevating the context so that people get into it a bit more. Yeah. And actually, as you say theater, things. that makes me think of suspension of disbelief, right? Mm -hmm. So you're turning off your analytical brain a little bit when you're watching theater and engaging with what's happening on stage. And just right there, turning off your analytical brain. That's so often what we need to do yes. if we're looking at true innovation and things that are going to feel uncomfortable, but maybe be a game changer, right? And so by casting these clients in a sense, they took on a character and they could think and act differently. Yeah, nice, nice. Um, I think simpler ways to do that. Also, if you're a little nervous about getting theatrical or just to bring in people who can represent that for you. Mm -hmm. So you can either act it yourself or you can bring in the kinds of people who you're designing for, other people who are running other kinds of co companies. Yeah. And, and do That's that either idea. in person or Zoom. On the Zoom note, I see we have loads of questions about how to make remote work more magical. Um, for organizations with lots of remote workers, Laura's asking, how do we make employee interactions magical or in social services mm -hmm. in the mental health field? Ooh. So I know you've done that with some of the technologies that you're using. How else could you yeah. that fatigue and burnout? Well, I certainly cannot claim to be an expert in this, uh, but I have also experienced it myself. Mm -hmm. So let's see a couple things there. Um, one of one of the ways that I've I think had some success in combating burnout, but also make employee interactions more magical, is knowing that so many of those interactions are going to be happening virtually. Yeah. Um, I've tried to actually find ways to make them happen physically. So that's by creating little back and forth mailers. Um, mm -hmm. Just a fun little thing there is like an envelope that actually has stacks and stacks of stacks of envelopes within it that are pre-stamped. And so like you open up one, you're supposed to yeah, write a note, right. slide it into the next, seal it. And it kind of can become this very effortless back and forth exchange. Um, so, you know, finding ways to actually pretty intentionally break out of the virtual space. Yeah. Um, but then find a tie in, have a conversation around that through. Yeah. Through envelopes medium. inside of envelopes inside of envelopes are always magic. Always great, But it's right? like, how can you do that at somebody's home? Either mail them something or have them use the Things around their home. Mm -hmm. I think there are ways that we've broken the screen. I, 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 one person that I also worked with at IDOU, she used to do simple things so that literally, physically, you were, everybody was making a hot cup of tea or coffee mm. or some hot drink at the same time so that you felt it and you were feeling it in your hands. Mm. Everybody at the same time. And so what are ways that you can break through that, that big flat screen? Yes. On that note, uh, another one, from Lacey is asking, how can magic and wonder be incorporated when folks are nervous or uncomfortable? So thinking mm -hmm. about, we talk a lot about psychological safety at work, the fact that that's elevated even more. How do you, you I, being in your shows, I know you do put people on the line, make them uncomfortable, but also somehow hold the space. Are there things yeah. you, you're aware of that you do to make sure people feel comfortable? Yeah, when well, I'm seeing in Lacey's question here, how magic and wonder can be incorporated when folks are nervous or uncomfortable about those types of things in the first place. I mean, I totally get that. Um, one of the ways that I do it in my shows, I'm trying to, I'm going to just talk and see if the translation yeah, comes outside yeah. of magic shows, but um, 
is when I'm performing on stage, I'm certainly trying to feel like a real human um, and welcoming to the audience as mm. opposed to sort of a performer with a script who is sending it out that way. So I always try to have a sense of invitation. Um, and then very early on, I try to bring audience interaction in, but I actually start in the audience. So I will go out there, let people stay seated, have people think of cards or whatever it is. Um, and then when I invite them up on stage, always in my head, the, the point is to make them the heroes. Uh, and yes. so, you know, some specific ways is I don't ask for super, uh, like, involved input. It's a lot of quick yes or no questions. Anywhere you'd like, just tell me to stop, those sorts of things. Yeah. At least up front. And then as we sort of start to create this understanding between audience and performer, we can get a little bit more interactive. Yeah. So you start so slow, start small, something we always talk about, and then figure out how yes. to push further. Okay. I'm going to give you a speed round on this one. Okay. Let's go. Uh, Magic into the classroom. Oh, Education, how do we bring more in there? Um, speed round, that makes it sound like I have the answer to this right away. Um, magic into the classroom? I mean, I did a lot of magic when I was in school. Um, I mean, I think there, there are some of the things we've been talking about in other places, bringing the outside in, mm -hmm. elevating challenges. So I see this with some of the most amazing teachers. They, they really elevate the challenge that's at hand. They make it a little bit more of a design brief and a challenge for each of the students rather than just here's your assignment. You know, some of the terms are what mm. we call it, uh, making sure, making it feel like it's a company mm. asking you for these things or your government leaders that making it something that you can win if that's one of the things. Actually, that does make me think, like one of the things I'm doing in Magic is creating an aha moment for audience mm -hmm. members. And I think generally I've heard very, you know, great teachers can get students to have the aha moment of learning and discovery themselves. So yeah. like, yeah, what are the pieces you can actually intentionally omit so that the students figure out the way to answer it themselves, maybe? Nice. Well, I usually get the last question, mm -hmm. but I can see there's a question here from the team at IDOU. Um, and I think it's a great one for us to finish on. Okay. They're asking, Andrew, could you cut Sue's in half? <laughs> Uh, wow. Well, that sounds rather violent, but, uh, yeah, Suze, let's give it a go. All right. Sounds good to me. Okay. This is, this is perfect. Actually here, let's get this up here. Um, I think maybe we can adjust this just a little bit. Uh, we'll see. Okay. So here, Suze, come on over here. Um, the truth is, yeah, yeah, right. This can get a little messy. So we have a box to just kind of contain anything okay. that might go wrong. Hold on. Uh, just a second. Here we go. It's right here. It should be pretty good. Um, yeah, just like that. I think people can kind of see everything there more or less here. So let's get you uh, inside here, Sue. This is good. All right. Bit of a squeeze, Bye. but if you can fit. Yep. Okay. Good. Just lock her in there so she can't really change her mind. Beautiful. And then, all right. Uh, good. So you can see her feet. Can you get a foot out there? Yeah, perfect. That's good. And then you can see her hand right there. Give everyone a wave. Lovely. Yeah. And then heads right there. All right. Uh, let's do it. Let's let's cut Susan in half. Um, Bye. I hope I can get you back together. We'll see. Here we go. Ready? Uh, Oh, sorry, forgot. Key part of this is actually cutting Sue's in half. So, all right, if we put a little knife just across the table there, everyone can see that. All right, sorry, forgot the key ingredient, but uh, we've got a blade across the table, top half, bottom half of Sue's. Sue's, how you feeling? I'm feeling all right. Let's go for it. Oh. All right, uh, do we get it? Yeah, I feel pretty burst in half. Okay, hold tight, ready? <laughs> There you go. There we go. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I think that's a wrap for today, everyone. Uh, and, oh, back together. Sorry. The team is telling me they still need Sue's. Okay, let's do it. There we go. There's one. There's two. Yep. And hopefully we got you back. Let's see. Is that it? Lovely. There she is. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I hope you had as much fun with this as we did. We wish you the best end to 2022. And uh, there are tons and tons of courses at IDOU to teach you all sorts of things around service, product design. And we hope that you'll come back and see us again in the new year. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Andrew Thank you. and Neil and everyone at the Magic Patio for joining us today.
Yes, sir.